My name's John Applebaum, and uh, I'm a Deputy Attorney General. I do civil rights. I'm also the chair of the public law section, well, former chair of the public law section of what was the state bar, and it's now the California Lawyers Association. And uh, I will tell you, I've done many educational conferences with Dean Chemerinsky, and um, I told him I was, I was a little disillusioned with our, our democracy and kind of what I've been seeing occur, um, concerns about the ability of people to vote, whether that vote will count, and, and how much it will count, and the role of the Supreme Court in making those decisions. And, and when I expressed my concerns to Dean Chemerinsky, he agreed that he had similar concerns, and he readily agreed to do um, today's presentation. Uh, before I, I talk more about Dean Chemerinsky, I, I have a number of, of thanks to give. One is the California Lawyers Association that, that made this possible, and uh, that they did so without any charge, so that it'd be open to the public because of its importance. Um, second, individuals at the public, uh, at the California Lawyers Association, including its executive director, Oyango Snell, associate, executive director, Tricia Horan, who worked uh, tirelessly to make this possible and unfortunately was sick and, and could not be here. Uh, director of marketing, Tej Bath, and their staff, including section manager, John Boxberger, Cynthia, to Oliver, Matt Overton, and Jennifer Navarro, and, and so many others at, at the California Lawyers Association. The association is dedicated to the continuing legal education of our attorneys, and we owe a debt of gratitude to Dean Chemerinsky, who has dedicated himself um, to the association and, and to the legal education uh, of all of California's attorneys and citizens. Uh, it's been a privilege to have worked with him over many conferences, and three things I've noticed. One, he's a riveting speaker. Two, I've never seen a memory quite like Dean Chemerinsky's. I have seen him give two-hour lectures. I've seen him discuss complex constitutional matters. I've seen him discuss plurality decisions, concurring decisions, dissenting decisions, and decisions from other jurisdictions in a perfect outline format without looking at a single note. And he gets all of it right every time. And I will tell you another third amazing thing about Dean Chemerinsky is, despite his many talents and gifts, he's a very humble person who always listens to alternative viewpoints um, and always gives back. He always finds a way, no matter how busy he is, he finds a way to give back at conferences like this um, and to give back to the public. So we so appreciate um, his efforts. As to his background, uh, Dean Chemerinsky, as you know, is the dean here at UC Berkeley. Prior to this, he was the founding dean at the UC Irvine School of Law. Prior to becoming a dean, he spent four years as a professor at Duke University, where in 2006, he won the Duke University Scholar Teacher of the Year Award. Prior to that, he taught 21 years at the University of Southern California. He is a renowned constitutional law scholar, having published 16 books and more than 250 law review articles. Dean Chemerinsky regularly serves as an expert commentator for national and local media, and frequently contributes opinions and editorials to newspapers, including the New York Times. In 2017, National Jurist Magazine named him as the most influential person in education, legal education in our country. Dean Chemerinsky obtained his undergraduate degree from Northwestern University and his law degree from Harvard University. And with that, I will turn it Thank over you. to the Dean. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for that incredibly kind and sweet introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming. It's truly my honor and pleasure to have the chance to speak with you. And I am just so deeply touched to receive the award from the California Lawyers Association. No form of government lasts forever. <laughs> 
democracies are there until they're not. We all can think of countries around the world that at one point were democracies, but they're no longer democracies. Our country came remarkably close to losing its democracy in the last days of 2020, in the early days of 2021. What if Vice President Mike Pence on January 6th had done what President Trump and Professor John Eastman urged and declared that Trump was the next president of the United States? It would have been the first coup in the history of the United States. Our democracy would have been over. But also think about it. If 42,961 votes had gone differently in just three states, President Trump would have lawfully won in the Electoral College, though losing the presidency and the popular vote by seven million votes. The Republicans then would have controlled the Senate as well. Could it be that we'd still be considered a democracy when for the third time this century, the lose of the popular vote become president of the United States. As we all know, January 6th was the first violent insurrection, the nation's capital in our history. And as the January 6th committee has documented, President Trump played a key role in inciting that violence. After January 6th, after January 20th, and Joe Biden being inaugurated as president, I think everyone breathed a sigh of relief. The media talked about how the guardrails of democracy had held. And of course they did. And yet, like as John said in his introduction, I was tremendously worried about the future of American democracy. I see what occurred in those waning days of 2020 and early days of 2021 is a symptom of larger problems that remain. Our country is more politically divided than it's been at any time since Reconstruction. There are many measures of this political division. During the Trump presidency, Trump's approval rating among Democrats was 6%. His approval rating among Republicans was 87%. That's the largest gap in all of American history. The second largest gap in all of American history is right now with Joe Biden's presidency and the difference between approval rating among Republicans and approval rating among Democrats. The division extends to every issue. This past winter, the Supreme Court decided the question of whether the Biden administration through the Occupational Safety and Health Administration could require that all workplaces with more than 100 employees have the workers vaccinated or tested for COVID. At the time this was before the Supreme Court, an opinion poll showed that 88% of those who considered themselves Democrats favored the vaccine mandate, but only 22% of those who considered themselves Republicans favored the vaccine mandate. We could take other issues like abortion, gun rights, and see a similar divide in our country. The threat to democracy is reflected in the loss of faith in American institutions of government. During the Trump presidency, his approval ratings hovered in the low 30s. For much of the Biden presidency, his approval rating was in the low 30s. Congress's approval rating right now is 18, and that might be 18 people, not 18%. <laughs> The United States Supreme Court has its lowest approval ratings of all of American history. Last September, there was a Gallup poll that gave the Supreme Court an approval rating of 40% and a disapproval rating of 53%. In June, there was a Gallup poll that had the lowest level of public confidence in the Supreme Court. It was 25%. A Marquette University poll in July showed that the Supreme Court's approval rating had gone down to 38%, and its disapproval rating was almost 60%. How long can any government survive with the loss of public confidence that we're seeing from the American people in all of the branches, 
in all of the levels of American government. 70% of those who consider themselves Republicans believe that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. Notwithstanding, there's no evidence to support this. Every court to consider it, state court, federal court, Republican appointed judges, Democratic appointed judges, all found no evidence of voter fraud or that the election was stolen. But 70% of Republicans continue to believe that the election was stolen. We're already hearing claims before elections are even held that the election's going to be stolen. Whoever's going to be the loser is going to say it's for that reason. How can democracy survive if there's not trust in the election process? All of this has caused me to think about why is it now that we have this crisis of democracy? Why is it now that perhaps the one thing that liberals and conservatives can agree upon is that American democracy is in danger. What I want to suggest to you is that some choices were made when the Constitution was written that are responsible for many of the problems that we're seeing today. I would suggest to you that some Faustian bargains were struck in order to get the Constitution ratified in Philadelphia, in order to get it approved by the states. Some of those choices have haunted us throughout American history, such as those made with regard to race. Others, for reasons I can explain, have come to particularly plague this country in recent decades and going into the future. And so my thesis is that in many ways, the Constitution was bad bones, a bad start, and that it's what can now be seen as contributing to the crisis of American democracy. And then the question is, if America's democracy is broken, what can we do to fix it? I want to divide my remarks this afternoon into three parts. The first part, we'll talk about those Faustian bargains that were struck in drafting and ratifying the Constitution. Then second, I want to talk about why things have gotten worse in the last few decades and why the problems are likely to continue into the future. And then third, I want to offer some tentative thoughts but what are the possibilities in terms of where do we go from here? And then I'll save some time for questions before I know we need to finish to go over to the Shattuck Hotel for the event that's going to be there. To be clear in the first part of my remarks, there's much that was brilliant in the Constitution. There's an enormous amount to admire. The very fact that they could design a structure of government in 1787, it's lasted today to 2022, and into the future. The structure of separation of powers makes an enormous sense. The choice to write the Constitution into language that's sufficiently vague that can be interpreted in the future in a living Constitution. So I am not saying that the Constitution overall was an undesirable document. But I am saying there's some choices made there that were quite undesirable. Admittedly, and as I've already acknowledged, the Constitution would never have been ratified in Philadelphia or approved by the states without these choices. But that's why I call them Faustian bargains. Well, let me talk about a couple of these. The first were the choices made with regard to slavery and race. 25 of the men at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia were slave owners. It was clear from the outset that the southern states, whose economies depended on having an enslaved population, would never have agreed to a constitution that eliminated the institution of slavery. The idea of having the constitution abolish slavery was never on the table at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. But those who drafted the constitution in Philadelphia went much further than just tolerating the institution of slavery. They wrote the institution of slavery into the Constitution. I can give you three examples of this. One was they prohibited Congress from banning the importation of slaves for 20 years. And they made this one of only two provisions in the Constitution that could not be changed by constitutional amendment. One thing that's interesting here 
is that by the time of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787, many of the southern states had already prohibited importing additional enslaved persons in the country. Virginia, which had a very large population of enslaved individuals, had already banned importing additional enslaved people into the country. They had a sufficient slave population that was going to reproduce that they didn't feel the need to import additional individuals. North Carolina and South Carolina, though, vehemently objected to allowing Congress to even have the power to consider banning the importation of additional enslaved individuals. North Carolina's delegates to the Constitutional Convention made clear that they would leave and not participate unless a provision was written in that took this power away from Congress. Article 1, Section 9 makes clear that Congress could not ban the importation of additional enslaved persons for 20 years. And as I said, Article 5 mentions only two provisions that can't be changed by amendment. And one of that is just what I've talked about. But th there's more in the Constitution about it. There was a major debate about how to apportion representatives among the states. And the southern states were concerned that if their enslaved population wasn't counted, it would hurt them politically. Northern states, of course, would benefit proportionally if the enslaved population in the south wasn't counted. Obviously, the enslaved population couldn't vote. And so a compromise was struck. It was based on something James Madison had suggested at the Confederation Congress. And this was that enslaved individuals would count as three-fifths of a person in allocating representatives to the House of Representatives. This gave the southern states a political advantage. It reduced the pressure on the southern states to ever eliminate slavery as a practice. And as I'll talk about, come to make huge difference with regard to the Electoral College. But even this wasn't enough for the framers of the Constitution. There was another provision into Article 4, Section 3 that said that if an enslaved individual escaped to a free state, that person had to be returned to his or her owners in the slave state. This is the Fugitive Slave Clause. And in Prigg versus Pennsylvania, Justice Joseph Story, one of the most revered in all of American history, so the Constitution would not have been adopted without the Fugitive Slave Clause and aggressively enforced it. Alexis de Tocqueville said that race was the critical flaw that American democracy was based on. And of course, the choices that were made in 1787 with regard to race have haunted this country from the outset and continue to plague this country today. A second set of Faustian bargains that I want to talk about concern how government was structured, and specifically the distrust the framers had of the people and the way in which they embraced anti-democratic choices in designing government. Now, I want to be clear here, too. I believe there is a role for checks on democracy. I think that it's desirable to have built-in breaks to keep people from going too far, especially in taking away rights and persecuting minorities. But think about the institutions that were created by the United States Constitution. The Constitution created four institutions of government. One is the President of the United States. As you know, the President is not chosen by popular vote. The President is selected by the Electoral College. This was suggested relatively late in the deliberations at the Constitutional Convention, but then quickly embraced. The Electoral College says that every state will have the number of electors that's equal to the sum of its representatives and its senators. And as I'll talk about in a moment, every state, as you know, gets two senators regardless of size. So this gives a real benefit to the smaller states that get two senators, even though they've much less than a population than the larger states. But it also makes the choice with regard to the three-fifths clause particularly important. Because without the three-fifths clause, southern states would have no benefit from 
their slave population in a political way, the enslaved individuals would not count in allocating representatives and therefore counting electors. But because of the three-fifths clause, southern states' enslaved populations would count representatives and then would count the number of electors that they got in the electoral college. None of what I said is accidental. All of it was evident at the time of the drafting and ratification of the Constitution. In the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton said that we need the Electoral College so elites who are informed would choose the president, not leaving it to the masses. At the Constitutional Convention, Hugh Williamson, a delegate from the state of North Carolina, praised the Electoral College because it would allow states with enslaved populations to be able to have their benefit in allocating electors. None other than James Madison, a delegate from the state of Virginia to the Const Constitutional Convention, said exactly the same thing. Well, the second institution created by the Constitution is the United States Senate. There was a huge dispute at the Constitutional Convention as to how to allocate representatives in Congress. The large states wanted it to be entirely based on population. The smaller states wanted every state to have an equal number of representatives. So as you know, a compromise was struck. The House of Representatives has its representatives chosen based on the population, whereas every state gets two senators. Now, that's always been profoundly anti-democratic. The Supreme Court, as you know, in the 1960s articulated the principle of one person, one vote. This says, for any elected body, all districts must be about the same in population. That's true for every state legislature, every city council, every county board of supervisors or board of education if it has districts. It's true for the House. There's only one elected body in the United States that doesn't have to meet one person, one vote. And that's the United States Senate. And when the Constitution was written, senators were not chosen by the people. Senators were chosen by state legislators. And it remained that way for about 130 years of American history. Hard to think of anything less democratic than having the legislatures choose the Senate and each state gets two senators. Now, a third institution created by the government was the House of Representatives, the Constitution was the House of Representatives. And it was meant to be the democratic body. I'll come back and talk about that and how that's changed in just a bit. The fourth institution created by the Constitution was the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court justices, as we all know, are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And once confirmed, they have life tenure. There's much to admire in this. It was about giving the federal judiciary independence. If you go back and read the Declaration of Independence, one of the grievances there was the way in which the crown, the king, was able to control judges, removing the judges that didn't do the king's bidding. And the Constitution makes a very different choice, having judges chosen outside the democratic process and giving them life tenure. But if we think about it, whether it's desirable or undesirable, it's clearly an anti-democratic institution. Well, there's one other thing I want to point to that's in the Constitution that's anti-democratic, and that's the way in which it can be changed. Article 5 that I've already alluded to describes how the Constitution can be amended. It gives two possibilities, only one of which has ever been used. If an amendment is passed by two-thirds of both houses of Congress, in three quarters of the states, then it's valid. Well, in all of American history, there have only been 27 amendments, 28 if you believe the Equal Rights Amendment has been properly ratified. Since 1791, when the Bill of Rights was adopted, only 17 amendments, maybe 18, with the ERA have been adopted. It's a procedure that is now thought of as almost impossible. I believe. It's crucial to make the Constitution difficult to change, though I'd also suggest that the framers went too far in making the Constitution difficult to change. And the more the Supreme Court says that it's not a living Constitution, the more the court takes originalism, it's the only way of interpreting the Constitution, 
then the inability to amend the Constitution becomes ever more problematic. I'd also suggest other choices that were made caused us problems. The tremendous emphasis on states' rights in drafting the Constitution, the regard of the states as the primary institution of government, limiting Congress's power, I think has also come to haunt the country throughout its history. Well, let me focus then on the second part of my remarks. Why have things gotten worse over the last several decades and a half century? Why do we face the crisis of democracy now? And specifically, I want to show how choices that were made then are causing our problems today. Let me talk about the institutions of government that I just reviewed. One is the Electoral College. Now, once in the 20th century did the candidate who won the popular vote lose the presidency in the Electoral College. In this century, that's happened twice, in the year 2000 and the year 2016. It almost happened two other times. It almost happened in 2004. If John Kerry had won the state of Ohio, and he lost by a relatively close margin, he would have won in the Electoral College despite losing the popular vote nationally. And as I said in my very introduction, as you know, just under 43,000 votes, less than the number of people who fit in a football stadium, had come out differently in three states, then Donald Trump would have won the Electoral College. I don't think it's coincidence that we've seen this happen so often in the 21st century and not in the 20th century. I think there's some things that are directly responsible for this. The way in which population shifts have occurred with more people moving to urban areas. Also, I think that another thing that's contributed to it is the political realignment, the way in which since the 1960s, southern states have shifted from Republic Democrat to Republican. And when you look at the lineup of states in the country, you can easily see why states with smaller populations but with a total of more electoral votes are likely to be able to elect a candidate. One other thing has contributed to this that hasn't gotten enough attention, and that's winner take all in the Electoral College, and this isn't constitutional at all. All of the states except Maine and Nebraska have winner take all. That means whoever wins the popular vote in that state gets all of that state's electoral votes. So if you voted for Donald Trump in California, your vote had no meaning because Joe Biden got all of the electoral votes. Of course, finally, if you voted for Joe Biden in Texas, your vote had no meaning because Donald Trump got all the electoral votes. There is nothing in the Constitution but winner take all. But political scientists have documented that winner take all substantially increases the likelihood that the loser of the popular vote can win in the Electoral College, especially in light of the population shifts and the partisan realignment that I've talked about. And I think, I think I can show based on these political science studies that it's quite likely that in 2024, 2028, 2032, the loser of the popular vote could then win in the Electoral College. Well, a second institution that I talked about is the United States Senate. And the Senate has become more undemocratic, too. Some of this is because of the population shifts that I just talked about. At the time the Constitution was written, Virginia was the largest state in population, and Delaware was the smallest state in population. The difference was just under 10 to 1. Today, California is the largest state in the country in population, obviously. And Wyoming is the smallest state in population. And the difference is almost 70 to 1. But Wyoming and California both get the same number of senators. I can put this to you another way. As you know, at the moment, there are 50 Democratic senators and 50 Republican senators. The 50 Democratic senators represent 60% of the population. The 50 Republican senators represent 40% of the population. Another thing that has made the Senate more anti-democratic is the way in which the filibuster has changed. 
There's a debate over when the filibuster started, but it clearly existed at least from the late 19th century. And for most of us, our image of the filibuster comes from the wonderful Frank Capra movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, where Jimmy Stewart, fighting corruption, stayed at the podium in the Senate. It's a collapse of exhaustion. And that's how the filibuster used to work. A senator would have to hold the floor until he or she no longer could do so. Well, that was changed in the 1970s. And it was changed to create what I've often called the virtual filibuster. No longer does a senator have to hold the floor in a filibuster. The Senate was concerned that having this tied up all of its work. So instead, the way it works is all a senator has to do is indicate that he or she wants to filibuster. And then the Senate just goes on with all of its regular work. And unless there's 60 votes for cloture, then the filibuster succeeds. Senators representing 22% of the population can stage a successful filibuster, depending on who they are and where they're from. And there are only a few things where filibusters aren't possible. Budget bills, the reconciliation process, aren't subject to filibusters. Nomination of federal judges, Supreme Court, Federal Court of Appeals, Federal District Court, and cabinet officials aren't subject to filibuster. But almost everything else is subject to a filibuster. And so what that means is it takes 60 votes to get anything adopted in the Senate, which especially when our country is so divided along partisan lines, seems an almost impossibility. I believe that the filibuster is unconstitutional. I think where the Constitution wants something more than majority, it says so, and it doesn't with regard to the filibuster. But at the very least, it's tremendously anti-democratic to allow 40 to block the will of 60, and 40 could represent as little as 22% of the population and be able to do this. And so the shift in population, together with the change in the rules of the filibuster, had made the Senate even less of a democratic institution. What about the House of Representatives? As I mentioned, as we all know, the House was meant to be the democratic body. But the key case here, the major change here, occurred with regard to partisan gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering is nothing new. It's the practice where the political party that controls the legislature draws election districts to maximize seats for that party. We say a Republican-controlled state legislature draws state legislative districts to maximize seats for Republicans. Or a Democratic-controlled city council draws city council districts to maximize safe seats for Democrats. It takes its name from a governor of Massachusetts early in American history, Elbridge Gerry, who engaged in the practice. And the map that he drew of districts looked like a salamander when it was put in the newspaper, and hence the phrase gerrymandering. It's said, though disputed, that Patrick Henry in Virginia tried to engage in this practice to keep James Madison from being elected in the first elections for the House of Representatives. But what's changed is, because of sophisticated computer programs, it's possible to engage in partisan gerrymandering with far more precision than ever before. Take the facts of the case that I was alluding to, Rucho versus Common Cause from just three years ago. Came from North Carolina. North Carolina is basically a purple state. It went for Obama in 2008, but Romney in 2016, and Trump in the next two elections, but always by a very close margin. Trump beat Biden in 2020 by 1.6% 1 of the votes cast. The North Carolina legislature was controlled by Republicans. And the person who led the reapportionment effort said that the goal was to draw congressional districts so Republicans had control of at least 10 of 13 seats. And the person was candid. And he said out loud, if I can come up with a way to give Republicans control of more of 10, 13 seats, I'll do it. They ran 3,000 maps through a computer of ways of drawing election districts in North Carolina. And they chose the one they thought was most likely to give Republicans control of 10 of 13 seats. 
no one should be surprised that it worked. You can split the Democratic voters among districts, or you can pack them all into fewer districts so the Republicans would be able to control of 10 of 13 seats. In 2016, first time these maps were used, Republicans won 10 of 13 seats in the House of Representatives from the state of North Carolina. In 2018, Democrats and Republicans statewide got almost exactly the same number of votes for seats in the House of Representatives, but Republicans won 10 of 13 seats. And the question is, is that unconstitutional? A three-judge federal court found it to be unconstitutional. It said that this is impermissible vote dilution. Another three-judge federal court in a jury manner said, this is discrimination on the basis of political party affiliation that violates the First Amendment. The United States Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, said that challenges to partisan gerrymandering cannot be heard in federal court. These are, in the words of the Supreme Court, non-justiciable political questions. So there is nothing that any federal court can do, no matter how egregious the partisan gerrymandering. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote for the court, and he said, the question with regard to partisan gerrymandering is when does it go too far? What's too much? And we don't have any way of answering that question. Justice Kagan wrote a vehement dissent. I think about how long she serves, it'll be one of the most famous dissents. And she said, no matter what's too much, this is too much. She said, in a democracy, it's supposed to be voters who choose their representatives. With partisan gerrymandering, it's representatives who are choosing their voters. And she said, there are ways of defining tests and criteria for when partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional. A fourth institution created is the United States Supreme Court. And there's ways in which the United States Supreme Court has become less democratic in ways in which the Supreme Court has undermined democracy. At the time the Constitution was written in 1787, average life expectancy was 38 years old. So the idea of saying somebody would have a position for life wasn't thought to mean that they'd be there for decades. But now, of course, I say thankfully, life expectancy is a lot longer. I can give you this in terms of statistics. From 1787, when the Constitution was written, until 1970, the average tenure of a Supreme Court justice was 15 years. From 1970 through today, for the justice appointed in this period, who are no longer on the court, their average tenure was 27 years. I'll give examples. Think of Justice Clarence Thomas. He was 43 years old when he was confirmed for the court in 1991. If he remains on the high court until he's 90 years old, the age just John Paul Stevens retired, Thomas will be a justice for 47 years. Justice Amy Coney Barrett was 48 years old when she was confirmed two years ago. If she remains on the court until she's 87, the age was Justice Ginsburg died, she'll be a justice until the year 2059. A study estimates that the average tenure of Supreme Court justices now will be about 35 years. That exacerbates the undemocratic nature of the court. But the Supreme Court in its decisions has undermined democracy. Think of what the Supreme Court has done with regard to the Voting Rights Act. I regard the Voting Rights Act of 1965 as one of the most important laws adopted in my lifetime. One provision of it, Section 5, said for jurisdictions with a history of race discrimination in voting, they would need to get pre-approval, technically called pre-clearance, from the Attorney General or three-judge court in Washington where they changed their election practices. There were hundreds of instances where proposals to change the election system were rejected, denied pre-clearance. It's estimated there were thousands more instances where it was never even sought because it was known that pre-clearance would be denied. These provisions were scheduled to expire in 1982. Congress overwhelmingly extended them for another 25 years. President Ronald Reagan signed it into law. They were then scheduled to expire in 2007. 
Congress held 15 hearings. It created a legislative record, it's tens of thousands of pages long, documenting continued discrimination and the need for Section 5 preclearance. It passed the Senate 98 to nothing. It passed the House with only 33 no votes. Can you imagine the Senate today passing anything 98 to nothing? Only 33 no votes in the House? President George W. Bush signed it into law. But in Shelby County versus Holder, on June 25th, 2013, the Supreme Court, five to four, declared preclearance provisions unconstitutional. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote for the majority. The puzzle I always ask my students is, what was unconstitutional in the eyes of the Supreme Court but preclearance? The only thing that John Roberts said was, it violated the principle of equal state sovereignty that Congress had to treat all states the same. But where does the Constitution say that? I'm not an originalist, but it's clear that that wasn't the original meaning when the 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment were adopted. The same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment passed the Reconstruction Act that created military rule over southern states. So it obviously didn't believe that all states had retreated the same. Chief Justice Roberts said, even though preclearance is being struck down, there's another provision in the Voting Rights Act that provides protection. That's section two of the Voting Rights Act that says that state and local governments can't have election systems that discriminate on the basis of race or against certain language minorities. In 1982, Congress amended this to say that proof of a racially discriminatory impact is sufficient for liability. But on July 1st of 2021, in Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, the Supreme Court tremendously weakened Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, at least when it's used to challenge election practices like absentee ballots, polling places, and the like. Justice Samuel Alito wrote for the court and said, you have to balance this against the state's interest in preventing fraud. That's nowhere in the Voting Rights Act. He said, well, you have to look at the number of other ways that you can vote in the state. How does this compare to the kind of practice that existed in 1982? None of that's in the statute. None of that's in the legislative history. As Justice Kagan said in another powerful dissent, all of this is going to make it so much more difficult to challenge the laws being adopted across the country that are limiting voting. Since January of 2021, 18 states have adopted 33 laws that are designed to make it more difficult for individuals to vote, specifically make it more difficult for Democrats to vote. And it'll have the effect of making it more difficult for people of color to vote. And the effect of Brnovich made it harder to challenge it. And tomorrow morning in the Supreme Court, they're going to hear all arguments in Merrill versus Milligan about whether or not the Voting Rights Act can be used when it comes to challenging congressional districts. It comes out of Alabama. Alabama is a state where the black population is 27%. But the Alabama legislature drew districts so that black Americans in Alabama would have only one of seven districts that could conceivably elect a representative. A three-judge federal court found that this violated the Voting Rights Act. Two of those three judges have been appointed by President Donald Trump. One was appointed by President Bill Clinton. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court stepped in stayed that in his oral arguments tomorrow. And many believe the court's going to further weaken, maybe invalidate crucial provisions of the Voting Rights Act. So these are the things that have happened that I think make the threat to democracy much greater now. They're exacerbated by social media and the problem of false speech, by the continuing inequalities in our society based on race and social class. So the third and final part of remarks is what do we do about it? Where do we go from here? And all I want to suggest is a number of possibilities that we've got to think about. One possibility is that the Supreme Court, by interpretation, solves some of these problems. Some can't be solved by interpretation. The Supreme Court can't say that each state doesn't get two senators. That's written into the Constitution and it can't be changed even by the amendment process. But the Supreme Court could declare winner take all 
to be unconstitutional, and that would make it less likely that the loser in the popular vote would win in the electoral college. The Supreme Court could declare the filibuster to be unconstitutional for reasons I alluded to and could explain in more detail. The Supreme Court could say that partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional and allow challenges to go forward against it. I didn't talk about campaign finance, but the Supreme Court could reverse Citizens United, which has such a corrupting effect on our election system. Now, I emphasize the Supreme Court could do these things, but I don't think it's likely that the Supreme Court will be doing this in the foreseeable future, given its composition. But if the Supreme Court doesn't come to the rescue of American democracy, then where do we turn? Another possibility would be constitutional amendments. The Constitution could be amended to eliminate the Electoral College. The Constitution could be amended to overturn life tenure for Supreme Court justices. The Supreme Court could be amended to eliminate partisan gerrymandering. But such amendments seem very unlikely. When it comes to the Electoral College, it takes three quarters of the states to approve a change. And the small states that benefit from the Electoral College are never going to vote for such an amendment. The allocation of two senators per state can't be changed by the amendment process. It's the other of the two provisions in Article 5 of the Constitution that can't be changed through the amendment process. I think there's probably enough support for life tenure for Supreme Court justice for amendment there, but I worry that there's no constituency that cares enough about it to the hard work for constitutional change through the amendment process. It's conceivable that the Constitution can be amended to deal with the problem of campaign finance, but again, I don't see that as likely to happen. Well, if the solution doesn't come from the Supreme Court, and it doesn't come from constitutional amendments, then we have to face the question, is it time to think about drafting a new Constitution? The Constitution was written in 1787 for an agrarian slave society. It's astounding we still want to be governed by it today. It's revered in this society. People stand in long line in the National Archives to see the parchment under glass. They made a play that was a Broadway hit about one of its drafters. Children memorized the preamble in elementary school. But I wonder if all this reverence to the Constitution doesn't keep us from recognizing how flawed it is as a document. It's frightening to think of a constitutional convention at this point in time. How would we choose its delegates? How would it overcome the divisions? And yet society was no less divided in 1787 when there's the Constitutional Convention. It was born of necessity of the failure of the Articles of Confederation. The country was almost bankrupt at that point. Rebellions were breaking out. My hope would be that if there'd be a Constitutional Convention, those who were there would recognize that their efforts would matter only if they could reach a compromise in a series of compromises that could be approved throughout the country. I think if there is a constitutional convention, it needs to put forth its document to all of the people for a vote in a plebiscite, not to leave it to the states. Now you might say there's no mechanism in the Constitution for this, and that's right. But the Articles of Confederation said that it took unanimous approval of the states to change the Articles of Confederation. Article 7 of the United States Constitution said it would be effective when ratified by three-fourths of the states. In fact, when George Washington was elected president, North Carolina and Rhode Island had not yet ratified the Constitution, and Rhode Island didn't do so for a year into the Washington presidency. That was illegitimate under the Articles of Confederation, but the Constitution was still deemed valid. Well, likewise, I think our country would need to adopt a new Constitution to do what we saw in Chile a couple of weeks ago, put it to the vote of the people and hopefully it would be a document that would keep what's excellent in our current Constitution, but also reform what needs to be changed. What if none of this happens? What if we don't see the Supreme Court changing course, there's not constitutional amendments, there's not a new Constitution? Well, our country will go along where it is now. 
And maybe there'll be a charismatic leader who will unite the country. Maybe there'll be a crisis that brings the country together. But if not, I predict the path we're on now will ultimately lead to this country coming apart. Maybe it will come apart with a devolution of power to the states, preserving weak national government for national security. Maybe it will be a voluntary separation of states. Maybe it will be a violent coming apart. But it's hard for me to see, if the country stays where it's going now, that something like that won't happen. I don't know that it'll happen in the near term. I don't have it in my lifetime. But I do think it's what makes me so frightened in terms of the path of American democracy. And I think a lot about the Supreme Court. Today was the first Monday in October. It came back this morning, 10 o'clock Eastern time. What will it mean for a country at a time when it's so politically divided to have a court that's come down so solidly on one side of that divide and so far to the right? It means I don't think the court's going to save democracy. I don't see how Congress can save democracy. I don't know how the president's going to save democracy. So ultimately, what I come to is it's going to have to be the people who save democracy. And then the question, and it's a question I want to pose to you this afternoon is, how do we do it? Thank you so much. We have time for some questions? I'm glad to take questions or comments. Anything. There's a, I'll, here and here, just go sell your hands first. Please. Um, I've heard about this uh, the independent state legislature theory. Sure. Um, It is coming before the Supreme Court. The question is about the independent state legislature theory. In the case that's before the Supreme Court is Moore versus Harper, it comes from North Carolina, and it involves partisan gerrymandering. After the 2020 census, the North Carolina legislature drew in election districts, just like every legislature had to draw new districts after the 2020 census. The North Carolina legislature, controlled by Republicans, drew the districts so Republicans control at least 10 and likely 11 out of 14 seats. Republicans picked up one additional seat after the 2020 census. The North Carolina Supreme Court found that the partisan gerrymandering violated the North Carolina state constitution. The case I told you about, Rucho versus Common Cause, said only that federal courts could not strike down partisan gerrymandering. In fact, Chief Justice Roberts, at the end of his majority opinion, in talking about alternatives, said state courts might do this. Well, the North Carolina legislature has gone to the US Supreme Court and said, the courts should be powerless to enforce the state constitution. That Article I, Section 4 of the Constitution says, the legislature of each state shall determine the time, place, and manner of choosing representatives and senators in Congress. And they say legislature means legislature, and that therefore the courts are powerless. Now, this is significant in itself, because if the Supreme Court would adopt this, then there's truly no check on partisan gerrymandering, not in federal court, not in state court. But the implications are even more serious. There's another provision of the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, that says the legislature of the state shall be responsible for choosing the electors from the state in the Electoral College. Imagine the Supreme Court adopts the independent state legislature theory as to Article I, Section 4. It was originally developed for Article II, Section 1 in presidential elections. Imagine, hypothetically, a few, Republican, a few states where Republicans control the state legislature. Let's make them, hypothetically, Wisconsin, Georgia, and Arizona. And imagine in 2024, the Democratic presidential candidate wins the popular vote, as Biden did in 2020. But the state legislatures, following the Supreme Court's decision, if it adopts the independent state legislature theory, says, we're going to give the electors of our states to the Republican candidate, notwithstanding a state law that says the winner of the popular votes to get them. And no court can stop us from doing this, because it's the legislature. And that then would make the Republican candidate president. I predict if that happens, our country would come apart. <laughs>
That's the implications of the independent state legislature theory. Until recently, it was a fringe theory. I think it's clearly wrong because every power allocated to the legislature has to be exercised in a constitutional way. And it's always the role of the court to make sure that's so. Article 1, Section 8 gives Congress powers, but the court gets to decide if they're exercised in a constitutional way. The same thing should be true. And in fact, in 2015, in a case called Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Redistricting Commission, the Supreme Court 5 to 4 rejected the independent state legislature theory. But two of the five justices in the majority in that case were Kennedy and Ginsburg, and they're no longer on the court. And among others, Roberts Thomas Alito dissented in that case. Scalia was the other dissent. And much more recently, Justices Thomas Alito and Gorsuch have indicated that they accept the independent state legislature theory. So the case is Moore versus Harper, and we argue later this fall, and that's why it matters so much. You were going to ask a question? Many things. One is the Electoral County Act, which was adopted in 1887, needs to be changed to make clear the process that the Electoral College operates under and the limited role of the Vice President in counting the votes. It's passed the House. Hopefully, it will pass the Senate. It looks like it will have enough votes. And so that's one step. Second, Congress had before it major voting rights legislation that were considered this spring, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. It would have done many things. It would have eliminated partisan gerrymandering with regard to congressional elections. It would have strengthened key provisions with regard to the Voting Rights Act. Um, it would have improved the quality of elections around the country. It passed the House. Republicans filibustered it in the Senate. And the Senate Democrats, specifically Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, were unwilling to change the filibuster rules to get it through. If the Democrats keep the House, and that's a huge if, and if the Democrats gain a couple of additional votes in the Senate, that's a big if, then there would be the votes, I think, to change the filibuster to adopt voting rights legislation. But without the voting rights legislation, it becomes much harder to have the kinds of reforms we talk about, which then makes it much harder to get the majorities needed in the House and the Senate to adopt them. But there is legislation that Congress can do. One of the problems that you put your finger on is that the elections, even for federal offices, are run at the state level. And states have enormous discretion in how to conduct them. And Congress could create better national standards with regard to elections. They, they tried after the 2000 election, but they didn't go far enough. Please. First of all, thank you so much for this. Oh. The question is how, if it's not through the two-party system, to do it. I mean, the difficulty, and we saw this in 2000, is a third-party candidate can undermine the ability of a candidate to win. I mean, uh, we can talk at length about everything that happened in Florida. Had Ralph Nader not been on the ballot in Florida, Al Gore would have won and would have been president of the United States. 
So the, there's a danger of a third party. We can talk about what it meant for Ross Perot to run in 1992 relative to George H.W. Bush losing the election. So how do you develop a meaningful third party system that's not a danger to being able to achieve other things? Also, given how campaign finance is structured nationally and often in the states, developing a viable third party system becomes enormously difficult. Um, so I'm skeptical of the ability to get the necessary changes, but I'm also even more skeptical that we're going to have a meaningful change in the two-party system. Any other? Uh, time for one more question? Please. There's so many ways to answer that. The place that I would start by was looking at the statistics of the tremendous disparity in the number of children in poverty in white families compared to Latinx or black families. That's the continuing legacy of the choices that were made with regard to slavery back in 1787. You could measure, look at measurements with regard to differences in wealth among, say, white families opposed to Latinx families or black families. And there's an enormous difference. We can look at all of the measures that continue to exist with regard to discrimination. We can look at it with regard to voting, which is what I was talking about, in terms of the continued... The, um, I wrote a book that came out last year that focused on policing. A black man in the United States has nine times the likelihood of being killed by the police compared to a white man in the United States. A Latino man has four times the chance of being killed. So these, to me, are the legacies of choices that were made long ago. I hope that answers your question. I think that's all the hands I see. Oh, go ahead. I didn't see, I'm sorry. I'm going to give you the typical law professor answer, yes and no. Um, the th two primary drafters of the Federalist Papers were James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. John Jay wrote some of them. Um, and it's important to remember the Federalist Papers were basically what we call today op-eds to get into New York to ratify the Constitution. And we take them as authoritative about the meaning of the Constitution when in reality, they were advocacy to try to get New York to ratify the Constitution. It did by the slimmest of margins. Um, it was Thomas Jefferson who was most famous for saying that the Constitution should be replaced at intervals. But there's also statements from Madison that would support that he believed that as well. I think the one thing that's clear is none of them could have expected that the document that they were drafting would last for 237 years that none of them believed that their views and intent would control. I mean, it'd be amazing to you know, talk to James Madison and say, could you believe that what you said was going to be binding in 2022? It was unthinkable. So the answer to your question is yes, though Jefferson said that even more than the founder, those who wrote the Federalist Papers. Thank you so much for coming today. Again, really appreciate it.